Okay, go ahead. Twelve. Twelve. On the same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gold gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The God will be a son. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses there there where you are. And I if I see the when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Okay. Does that tell you it tells me and it may say this explicitly in a couple verses, I don't know, I can't remember, but it tells me that if they didn't put the blood on there, their history. I'm sorry. You know what? It, it, it's very specific. When I see the blood, I will pass over. And if there's no blood, then I won't pass over. And obviously that is a picture of our salvation. Jesus' blood is the only thing, the only thing that keeps us from destruction. That's it. When I see the blood, I will pass over. And we are applying the blood to our own lives. Okay. Now, here, uh, well, I'm not even going to get into that right now. Go ahead. 14. This is the day you are, you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats yeast, any, anything with yeast in it, from the first day through the tenth, must be cut off from Israel. Okay, that means, and it, elsewhere in the Old Testament, cut off usually means to be executed. Okay. It can, but at other times it means to be executed. It just depends on, on and that's why I said at other times, I, not always, but generally, not, I shouldn't say generally, but other times it does, when it says you will be cut off from your people, then he qualifies it by saying that person must be put to death. So, you know, that's right. Okay. And it says, um, as it says here, so this day shall be a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. And boy, this is one thing they have done faithfully now for 3,500 years. It is the oldest ongoing celebration on planet Earth. And they have done it faithfully year after year, even in times of distress, times of duress, times of famine, they have always kept the Passover. They no longer use a lamb, though. They don't follow the biblical model. Guess what? That stopped at the time of uh, the destruction of the temple. Isn't that kind of peculiar how that happens? They now use chicken or something else, but yeah, it's just kind of funny how these things happen. But just so you know, um, it, I'll turn there and read it if you want to. You can go to Leviticus 23 too, but I will read you the feasts of the Lord. It says... Um, uh, these are the feasts of the Lord on verse 5 it says on the 14th day of the first month of twilight is the Lord's Passover that's what we're talking about and then it says and on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord seven days you must eat unleavened bread so there's actually two separate feasts the feasts of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread in the New Testament Luke will combine them as one and other times I believe you'll see that as well where they say this is the Passover or they say this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread when it's talking about the same thing because they're co-joined you'll see different terminology don't don't sweat that it's one feast you have the Passover followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread okay just so you know that and and if somebody uses one terminology for both feasts it's not an error it's just simply that they're co-joined feasts Passover leads directly into the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Red. And this, verse 14 and 15, show you that. Seven days um, you will, shall eat unleavened bread. And that is to show what, okay, let's do this now. Passover is a picture of our redemption. Okay, they're about to be redeemed. It's a picture of our redemption. What is the Feast of Unleavened Bread for then? What is the point of it? What happens after we are redeemed as people? What should happen, I should say? You should be beginning to be sanctified. Right. You should be purging out the sin from your life. This is a feast of the Lord, but it is a feast to the Lord. Do you see the difference? It's a feast of the Lord, the feast of unleavened bread, but it is a feast to the Lord. We are to live our lives, and Paul talks about this. We'll go there anyway. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You don't have to turn there if you don't want, but if you want to, go ahead. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is, like I said, this is just a small portion of what I'm going to be speaking about. Um, but I'll read you what he says, because he makes this symbolism, and if you've read 1 Corinthians, then you 
may not have noticed this. And this is why it's so wonderful what Paul says in here. Are you leaving? Have a good day there, Dave. No. All right, now. He says here, he says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, he says, your glorying is not good. They're out there glorying in some sin that's going on in the church, okay? Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A little bit of yeast makes the whole dough rise up. And that's the thing I just told you about San Francisco. Boy, is that true then, okay? Then he says, therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Since, that meaning after, since you are truly unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. So he's making a point. Christ is a Passover lamb, and therefore we should be living the Feast of Unleavened Bread in our lives. So what we're reading now that they observed is something that should apply to Christians always. Then he goes on and he says in verse 8, and if you've read these passages before, maybe they didn't have any meaning to you. I hope they do now if they didn't before. He says, therefore, let us keep the feast. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He is saying, Christ was sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. And then he goes on, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay, so he has just made a point from the Old Testament that we're reading about right now, and which is solidified in Leviticus chapter 23, that Christ is our Passover lamb, and therefore as Christians we should be living holy lives to the Lord. Okay? Have you ever seen that before when you read 1 Corinthians? Did you notice that? Because that is what he's talking about. He's referring right back to what we're talking about right now. Maybe. Okay. Well, if you did, that's good. But a lot of people may not have no idea because they've never read the Old Testament. So unless you know the Old Testament symbolism, what Paul is saying is you're like, well, yeah, I, I guess, you know. You can infer what he's saying, no problem. Be sinless. But why is he saying it? Because this is what Christ went through, and it was all prefigured all the way back in the book of Exodus. Okay. Dave's gone. Somebody else pick up where he left off. What is it? Uh, 14? 14. 15, somewhere around there. This day is to be a memorial for you, and you must celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You are to celebrate it throughout your generations as a permanent statue. You must eat unleavened bread for seven days. On the first day, you must remove yeast from your houses. Whoever eats what is leavened from the first day through the seventh day must be cut off from Israel. You are to hold a sacred assembly on the first day and another sacred assembly on the seventh day. No work may be done on those days except for preparing what people need to eat. Okay, so basically it's like a Sabbath day. They're not to do any work at all. However, on a normal Sabbath day, they're not even to cook. They're not to light a fire, nothing. Okay, this one says that you may prepare food to eat. The Sabbath is a little bit different, but a sacred assembly would be like us taking a holiday and saying nobody's to work in America today. You know, and we've done that a few times in America where they have actually mandated a day of fasting and prayer. They've done that, and I've, I've got the, the documents where the, the president or the Congress has come out and says we are asking for a day of fasting and prayer right in our government. Boy, have we come a long way. Wow, I'm telling you, we have come a long way in this nation. If you did that today, yeah. huh, yes? That reminds me, yesterday morning I saw on the news that there is a rule put before the Supreme Court right now. They're trying to get the Supreme Court to pass a new law that says that churches must follow the same rules of discrimination as everybody else. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Can you imagine that? Talk about violating the First Amendment. Yeah, right. Talk about completely violating the First Amendment. So I wonder what they're going to say. I wonder what they're going to do with that. Well, if it stands the way it is now, it'll be overturned because we have a 5-4, even though that one guy is nuts and makes a lot of bad decisions. I don't think he'd do it on this. But if we get one more Ginsburg in there, this nation is done. You know, uh, that's why the president is so powerful. Not because of the office he holds, but because of the people he appoints. That's right. That's, that's where the power comes in. And so let's just hope that the Lord keeps those hearts beating for another, another year. You know? you know, and if he doesn't, I got to tell you what, that means that he has turned us over to our own sin. If, if say Clarence Thomas kicks off today, if that happens, well, I know. But that means the Lord is in control of that man's heartbeat, not us. And if that happens, that means the Lord has turned us over. He said, I'm done. You know, that, so let's just keep in prayer that that doesn't happen and that we'll, we'll be somehow repentant before uh, 
uh, that happens and we'll get some decent judges in here because things can turn around, but there's a point where they won't turn around. So, okay, 17. You are to observe the festival of unleavened bread because on this very day I brought your ranks out of the land of Egypt. You must observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent statute. You are to eat unleavened bread in the first month from the evening of the 14th day of the month until the evening of the 21st day. Okay, now do you see that the 14th day is the Passover? And he's saying, eat the unleavened bread from the 14th day until the 21st day. Well, how many days is that from 14 to 21? Seven. It's seven. It's not eight. And the reason why is he says from the, let, let me count this up. From the 14th to the 21st, we have 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. From the evening of the 14th to the evening of the 21st. There's one to evening, two to evening, three to evening, four to evening, five to evening, six to evening, seven to evening. So it's seven days. So in this context then, it's one feast. It's seven days of unleavened bread. You have the Passover and unleavened bread, and that's why, I, I, I'm just getting my head straight on this, that's why Luke combines the two into one in the New Testament, because they are one even though the Passover is the first day of unleavened bread. But Leviticus 23 makes a distinction between the two. This is the Passover, this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but it is one week. Okay, got that out of the way. Go ahead. What if you made a mistake and you didn't know it was leavened and you ate it? Well, you know, unintentional sins uh, are dealt differently in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, you would think that you'd be able to tell because unleavened bread, if you come out to the beach, I serve it every week. Well, it's like what we have in the church here. It's, there's no doubt that there's no yeast in there. And a little yeast goes a long way. So I would imagine you'd know the difference. But um, they are really, really peculiar about that in Israel. I'm telling you, even to this day, if you have a loaf of bread in your hand and you're coming from the store and you're on a bus, apparently they look at you really nasty. They don't care who you are. You, you know, they know that it's unleavened bread. And this is the Passover, and they don't want to see that. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard some stories of people really getting bad looks just carrying bread home because this is their time of remembrance. But um, uh, you asked the question about what if they... Oh! Okay, we are going to find out later, it'll be I think in the book of Numbers, but there is a provision. Remember what it says that if somebody doesn't do this, they shall be, be, shall be cut off from their people. If you are unclean, you cannot observe this feast. Remember in the New Testament, it, they didn't want to go into Pilate's uh, thing They said because they didn't want to be defiled. They wanted to observe the feast. I don't, if you know the, what, that from the book of uh, John, I believe. Anyway, they didn't want to defile themselves because if they did, they couldn't observe the Passover. Then to them, that's a big deal. That's like not observing, we'll say, Christmas, okay? So, they, they, if they are defiled, they can't observe the Passover. But... In, I think it's the book of Numbers, you're going to see some people come to Moses and they say, well, these people were defiled because of a dead body. They touched a dead body, somebody died in their presence, whatever. They can't observe the Passover. It's not fair. And they're, because this is so important to them after this exodus from Egypt, it's so important to them that they, they want to do this year after year. And they said, well, it's not fair. And so Moses went to the Lord and the Lord says, what they say is right. If somebody can't observe it because of whatever reason on the first month they have a second Passover the next month they have a Passover for anybody that couldn't observe it on the second on the first month okay that tells me and I have to tell you I think about that because everything points to something else in the Bible and I've often thought what could that picture could that picture the rapture right because you know we have the you know I, I'm not saying it does I just try to think or could it be that we have the rapture and then we have the tribulation saints and they after the tribulation? There's something that it pictures, but I don't want to be dogmatic because I've never really thought it through. But every year on the second Passover, which nobody celebrates, I always get excited because you never know. You know? Anyway. Yeah, I mean, you just... Every feast day that comes along, I get jittery. I tell you, I just, oh, maybe the Lord's coming today. I'll be doing it on the 7th this Yom Kippur, and I'm going to be all, you know, you don't know. But I think it'll be a feast day. But the second Passover is one of those things, it's, it's just there. It's in the Bible, and it does picture something. It's not just there for one reason, it's there for a spiritual reason as well.